Hi. If you have started preparing for the CAT and are scared of the quantitative ability section or in general you want to know what exactly happens when it comes to the quant section, then this is the video that you should be watching. In this video, we will be looking at the topic wise weightages and the syllabus, so to say, when it comes to the QA section. And by the end of it, you should have more confidence in terms of what exactly to expect when it comes to the actual test. Now coming to the areas that are there in terms of quantitative ability, the entire section can be divided into five broad areas. Now I have arranged these areas in the descending order of the weightage that they have in terms of the cap. So if you look at the first area, it's called arithmetic. Now arithmetic is something that all of you would have done at school level and a lot of these topics you would be extremely familiar with. So at the very basis of it, we have three broad concepts that exist. The first is averages, the second is ratios and the third is percentages. Now whatever topics that are there which will use these basics will be a part of arithmetic broadly. So in terms of say averages, if you are looking at normal averages that will be a part of arithmetic in case of weighted averages, mixtures based questions, the allegation rule based questions, all those will be a part of arithmetic. In terms of ratios, if you are looking at questions that involve proportion, variation, all those will be a part of arithmetic. At a deeper level, if you look at ratios, questions involving time, speed and distance and time and work will also be considered as a part of arithmetic. In terms of percentages, questions that involve basic percentages, successive percentage change, profit and loss, simple interest, compound interest, all these will be a part of arithmetic. So all these topics that are fairly straightforward in nature will constitute the broader area of arithmetic. And the good news here is that arithmetic has historically contributed to a larger weight than any other area that exists in terms of quantitative ability. So in this case, we had 40% of the questions appearing from arithmetic. So to give you a context, if there are 22 questions, let's say in the quantitative ability section, then out of these 22 questions, roughly 9 to 10 questions will be from arithmetic. And that explains to the importance that arithmetic has in your overall preparation. So in terms of recommendations as well, it is highly recommended that you go through the entirety of arithmetic and don't really leave any of these topics that I spoke about as an option. So make sure that you have a good understanding of all these topics, which will allow you to at least make sense of 40% of the test. The second area that we are looking at is algebra. Now in terms of algebra, broadly you can divide the entire syllabus into linear equations, quadratic equations and polynomials. There will be a lot of sub area topics as well that you will have to get better at. So in terms of say quadratic equations, we are looking at topics like finding out the nature of the roots of a quadratic equation, finding out the sum of the roots of a quadratic equation, the product of the roots of a quadratic equation, how exactly do two quadratic equations behave, how exactly does it work in terms of inequalities, how to plot these equations on a graph and all those things you will be required to know in terms of algebra. In terms of polynomials as well, whatever was applicable to quadratic equations will also be applicable to polynomials. And that will constitute the entire topic of algebra. Now algebra, I'm sure a lot of people are scared of because there are a lot of formulas to be learned. There are a lot of numbers that exist and people in general are not very friendly with numbers. Having said that, algebra contributes the second largest weight in terms of the various areas that are there that one needs to get better at in terms of the quantitative ability section. And that is why algebra is extremely important. At the very least, you should be comfortable solving questions which involve simultaneous solving of linear equations. You should be extremely good at figuring out the various solutions that, can, uh, that a linear equation can have. You should be good at figuring out the nature of the roots, the sum of the roots, the product of the roots, the roots of a quadratic equation and some inequalities. If you are able to manage those things, you should be decent in terms of your preparation when it comes to algebra. Now, if you look at these two areas together, 40% and 25% will together give you 65%, which means that if you do these two areas properly and you know the concepts inside out, you will be able to make sense of at least two thirds of the entire test. So to give you a perspective, when it comes to CAT 2022, 
Algebra contributed to roughly five to six questions in each slot when it came to CAT 2022. And if you would have attempted arithmetic and algebra, you would have probably been able to solve 15 to 16 questions when it came to the QA section. In terms of the third area that we are talking about, in terms of CAT, it's geometry. So in terms of geometry, you have to be very good in terms of two dimensional figures, three dimensional figures and coordinate geometry. So when I say two dimensional figures, they include the basics of points, lines, angles, then triangles, quadrilaterals, polygons, circles. So that is what we are looking at in terms of two dimensional figures. You need to be very good in terms of the formulas that are there for the area or the perimeter, the various properties that will exist and so on. So all those things you need to be good at when it comes to two dimensional geometry. In terms of three dimensional geometry, we are looking at basically prisms and pyramids. So in terms of prisms, we are looking at parallelopipes, we are looking at cuboids, we are looking at cubes. In terms of pyramids, we are looking at topics like say cones, we are looking at spheres and hemispheres and so on. So all those things will be useful in terms of three dimensional geometry. In terms of coordinate geometry, there is a rare situation here and there wherein you will get a question from coordinate geometry which will require you to apply the direct formula that exists. So distance between two parallel lines, distance between a point and a line, finding the coordinates of the centroid, finding the coordinates of the uh, vertices of a triangle, finding the coordinates of the vertices of a parallelogram and so on. So all these question types can exist when it comes to coordinate geometry. Now geometry as a whole has roughly 20% weight when it comes to the actual CAT, which means that out of say 22 questions, you will be able to expect 4 to 5 questions from geometry. Now geometry as an entire area seems to be very vast because there will be a lot of properties that will be there to remember, there will be a lot of formulas that will be there to remember. In a lot of cases, the questions are visual in nature and the better you are at visualizing eventualities and going from point A to point B in a visual manner, the better you will be at geometry. So geometry compared to algebra will have lesser number of numbers as such. But if you look at the overall context of geometry, it's a lot more visual and there is a good amount of time that you will spend while solving questions that are based on geometry, although you might not exactly write everything on your paper. So that is where you have to be careful in terms of geometry as an area. But someone who is very good at geometry, it will be very rewarding in terms of the marks that you can get compared to the effort that you're going to put in. The next area that we are looking at is number theory. So whatever has to do with numbers, whenever there is something that has to do with some property of numbers that will be included in number theory. So we are talking about topics like say LCM and HCF, we are talking about divisibility, we are talking about questions from remainders, from factorials, base systems, indices, certs, logarithms and so on. Now although there are a lot of things that one needs to learn in terms of number theory, the weight that this particular area has when it comes to the CAT is roughly 10%. Meaning that you will see somewhere between two to three questions when it comes to the entire test. Now that is why this is something which is a difficult area in itself and it has less weight when it comes to the actual test. And that is why we recommend people to not get into the depths of say topics like a remainders, wherein you can go insane in terms of what remainders you can find out and how exactly to use those concepts. So here we advise people to have a working knowledge of all the topics that I have mentioned here on this particular slide. And obviously you can do some effort if you are in the 99th or the 99.5th percentile. So that is how you tackle this number theory area. The last area that we are talking about is modern math, wherein we have topics like permutations and combinations, probability, set theory, sequences and series and so on. Now again, this contributes to roughly 10% of the overall section, which means that you will have roughly two to three questions from this entire area. Now again, in terms of PNC and probability, you need to be very good in terms of visualizing the various outcomes that are possible. You need to be very good in terms of applying the AND or rule. So where do you need to multiply? Where do you need to add? Where do you need to write the positive cases? Wherein do you need to eliminate the negative cases? All those things have to come to you by instinct. And when I say instinct, it basically means through a lot of practice. So if you are someone who has practiced a lot of PNC, a lot of probability, is very good in terms of identifying the various patterns that exist in terms of say progressions or sequences and series, this is basically the area for you. Having said that, 
looking at the contribution, it contributes to 10% of the overall section. It's not exactly something that can be termed as a low hanging fruit. And that is why the order in which we have written these five areas should be the order in which you master these five areas. So for someone who is extremely scared of math as an entire subject, you need to focus on the top two areas that I have mentioned and also have a working knowledge of the other three. For someone who is extremely good at math and sees it as his or her strength, you need to be good at all five areas to make sure that you are maximizing your score when it comes to the CAP. Now in terms of the key lessons that you can have from people who have taken the CAT and people who have done well or not done very well at the quantitative ability section, there are some things that we can learn. The first thing is you need to focus on the easier questions first. Everybody will do that. So irrespective of however good or poor you are when it comes to the quantitative ability section, you have to solve the easier questions completely. If you spend your time on difficult questions that nobody else is going to solve, you are missing out on solving these questions that everybody is going to solve. And that is definitely going to impact your percentile because the percentile is a function of the score and the score is a function of how many easy questions you would have attempted. So for someone who is really good at math, it's very important for you to figure out as to which question deserves your attention. Because you might be able to solve 15 questions in a test, let's say for example. But if you have to solve questions within 40 minutes, you will have to prioritize those 7 or 8 questions which everybody else is going to solve. And that's where your ABC analysis and judging the level of difficulty of a particular question comes into the picture. So make sure that you are prioritizing the easy questions over questions that you like. So it's not about solving questions that you are interested in solving. It's about solving questions that deserve to be solved. It's very important to understand the distinction between these two. The second thing is you should not leave any area entirely. Now, of course, it's a meaningful thing to focus on a particular area because of paucity of time, let's say, for example, or because you are not good at the subject in general. But having said that, don't leave the entire area blindly. Make sure that you have a working knowledge of the concepts that are there in a particular area. So let's say, for example, you are not very comfortable with permutations and combinations. In spite of that, you should put in an effort to understand where exactly to use NCR, where exactly to use NPR. You have to understand where to use addition, where to use multiplication. So that concept of and and or should be something that you are very comfortable with. You should know how exactly to select objects, how to deal with repetitions, how to deal with derangement based questions. So these question types are the ones that are very straightforward and it should not take a lot of effort from your end to understand this. You might want to skip topics like arranging similar objects into distinct groups say for example or going into geometry based probability. So all those things you can maybe leave at this point in time but at least have a working knowledge of the basics of permutations and combinations. The third thing that you can learn is do not go for shortcuts without understanding the underlying logic. So if you are not convinced with the underlying logic, you will never be able to apply the shortcut A confidently and B in the manner that it is intended to. So you will see all these kind of shortcuts that are floating around. Someone tells you that the way to find the number of triangles with a certain perimeter is P square by 48. If you don't know the underlying logic or why exactly did this thing come into, the, into existence, you will never be able to apply it confidently and you will never be able to apply it in the correct context. Right? So to deepen your learning of the entire subject, it's very important for you to understand why a particular thing exists. Then you can apply it without putting any second thought to it, but make sure that the first time you learn a shortcut or you learn something that seems like magic to you, understand why exactly does this happen in this magical manner. And the last thing that you need to understand when it comes to the quantitative ability section is that the quantitative ability section, especially at the CAT, is going to be the last section that you are going to face. Now that is going to involve a lot of emotions as well in addition to your knowledge. Because you might not have had a satisfactory VARC section or you might have had a really challenging DILR section. Now after that, getting into the quantitative ability section puts a lot of pressure on you. There are a lot of people who feel fatigued by the end of the entire two hour thing and that's why the last section will be the one wherein you will be the most tired. Now the whole point of preparing for the test and taking sim cats one after the other is to ensure that you are in the right frame of mind when it comes to the QA section. So you have to keep your energy high, you have to be very enthusiastic when you are solving the QA section 
and that way you will end up doing very well at the overall test as well. So these are the lessons that you can learn from the entirety of the journey that a lot of people before you have traveled and the syllabus that was there that was shown to you on the previous slide. I hope you have a better understanding of what to expect when it comes to the QA section when it comes to the CAT and I wish you all the best with your preparation and hope you do really well at the test and the QA section in particular. Thank you.